So I think I'll begin with my talk, which is on anterior approach to subaxial spine. I'll be taking you through uh, the basic steps of approach, the structures which are which are at risk during anterior surgery in cervical spine, the complications you may come across. So I'll touch upon the controversies, and then I'll take you through our experience of anterior cervical discectomies and corpectomies. Well, I think the most crucial thing is the positioning of the patient. And this is usually how I position a patient of cervical spine. I tend to strap the neck uh, at the mandible and the shoulders are pulled down gently and then strapped to the OT table. You can have your IONM, IONM if, you, if you think it's important. Many times with myelopathy and neurological deficit, it is of very little use. But otherwise, IONM is very important. Having a chest roll, uh, having a small uh, bolster below the shoulder bo uh, blades help you, you to get the desired extension of the neck. And then you can approach the neck from left or right, whichever side you want to be. Other thing which you need to be careful is to have your table free uh, so that you can easily slide your C-arm or your O-arm during surgery. These are the basic landmarks which are important while giving incision. So if you want to approach C3, 4, you have to go, uh, hired, bone, hired bone is the landmark. You go down, thyroid cartilage is for 4, 5 disc, carotid tubercle is 6, and cricoid is for 7. <clears throat> there are a few things which you need to remember if the neck is short or long. Now, the classical anterior approach or smith Robinson approach is is, is very convenient if you're doing anything below C3 and uh, up to C7. But the moment you go above C3 or, C, or go below C7, things are going to be slightly difficult. Now, you know that uh, as you go above C3, you are almost close to the mandible. So access is going to be difficult. Preferably nasal intubation is good so that mandible can be taken away from, that, from the operative field. Similarly, if you're going down below C7, you have to be careful about the manubrium sterni. This is part of the preoperative workup. And uh, the tangent on the upper end plate of the lower instrumented vertebra should be at least above the manubrium sterni. And that then you know that you don't have to do anything uh, with the sternum and you can easily approach the T1 or T2 vertebra for lower instrumented vertebra. So taking through the steps, this is the horizontal incision, which I prefer. The first layer is the platysma, which comes across, split it or cut it, and then just go deep. Feel for, you can see the sternocleidomastite and stay medial to it, medial to the sternocleidomastite. <clears throat> it's all about blunt dissection. You go deeper, and then you can feel the great vessels lateral to the sternum astroid and your all the dissection has to be medial to it until you hit the bone once you hit the bone the next is identifying the level which usually is done with a needle which i tend to bend and preferably it has to be put in the vertebra initially so that you don't hit on the wrong disc and lead to degeneration later but if you're confident about the disc well, you can go into the disc and then check it on the C arm. Now, once you have uh, confirmed the levels, you go in with your clover retractors, which are the self retaining retractor system, especially for the cervical spine. You have to ensure that the blades of the clover are well below the strap muscles while retracting. Once you have identified the disc, then you can start doing the discectomies. Once you proceed with discectomies, you can distract the space for accessing the posterior part with the help of Casper pin retractor. So these are a very important armamentarium when you're doing anterior cervical spine. Having a good radiolucent retractors are of paramount importance. Yeah, I, I think I, I need to stress here that you have to have a microscope while doing ACDF. So uh, if you don't have a microscope, I would suggest 
while doing acdf accf still is okay and the corpectomy can still be carried out with naked eyes but anterior cervical discectomy in case you are doing preferably have your microscope in place now what are the structures which are uh, at risk the first thing which you can come across are superficial jugular veins anterior or external you can easily like get them to have your exposure no issues with that as you go down especially if you are at a slightly higher level omohoid is a muscle which comes in the place either you can retract it medially along with other muscles or you can or you can uh, cut it to gain access into the retropharyngeal space now once you are deeper in then the other thing which is of importance is superior thyroid artery especially uh, above four four and above c4 and above areas while you can have inferior thyroid artery if you are going below c6 now the controversies which are with with regards to recurrent laryngeal nerve is whether go from right or left now uh, literature wise the recurrent laryngeal is more common with right it's more common when you are operating on the lower cervical region and uh, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, on the right side is usually more anterior lateral on in the tracheoesophageal groove while the left side is more predictable in the groove and thus the chances of injuring the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is slightly less when compared to right lot of surgeons prefer going uh, the approach depending on which side desk or which side decompression is required so if in case you want to go for on the right side so they approach the spine from the left side while if you are having a desk prolapse on the left side then they tend to approach the spine cervical spine from the right side so i think it's all fine i personally go by left side now the causes of recurrent laryngeal nerve on right side so uh, inferior thyroid artery is one important landmark especially if you're going in lower aspect if you're ligating it without identifying you can put laryngeal nerve recurrent laryngeal nerve at risk similarly there could be anatomical variations excessive suctioning excessive traction these things can give rise to palsy of recurrent laryngeal nerve so how do you avoid it you have to the important uh, tip here is to ligate into the thyroid artery away from the thyroid gland so as lateral as possible you go and ligate the internal uh, inferior thyroid artery as i initially said the retractors have to be below the longus coli yeah so the moment your retractor slips and comes in the tracheoesophageal groove that is the time when you have chances of the injury and uh, leaving the uh, retractors or relaxing the retractors intermittently also helps in avoiding injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve this is one of the very nice diagrams where they have shown the variations which uh, with uh, uh, relationship of recurrent laryngeal nerve with the inferior thyroid artery and as i said uh, there could be variations and you have to ligate the thyroid vessels as lateral as possible and then you are safe our next complication which you can come across is thoracic duct injury thoracic duct injury is common if you are approaching lower cervical spine and left sided approaches are are notorious to have these issues you can come across chiral leakage and uh, during surgery and ligation of thoracic duct we would be the solution in case you come across any such thing the next thing is if you disturb the sympathetic plexus just overlying uh, or lateral to the longus coli you can have horner syndrome so again careful dissection not using monopolar too much staying uh, superiorly dissecting the longus coli you have to place retractor again as i said uh, this is of paramount importance the, the casper uh, the clavicle should be below the longus coli and uh, stay midline stay midline so between the two longus coli most of the dissection should be between the two longus coli now i think the most dreaded complication which a uh, spine surgeon would not like to have in his entire life would be having a complication of esophageal injury esophageal injury is something which may go undetected during surgery and that's why that's why uh, 
it it is difficult to manage you can uh, usually come across we, you can identify this only after surgery is being done most of the time patients can have vague complaints difficult to diagnose as i said the problem is the morbidity and mortality remains very high consensus on the management is not very clear and invariably the patient the patient would require uh, a surgical debridement and repair if the symptoms are getting worse now again the tips which i follow while uh, to avoid esophageal injury is one having a rails tube intubation the rails rails tube apart from uh, uh, the, the the esophagus is a collapsible structure and having a rails tube will identify will allow you to identify the structure again meticulous dissection judicious retract replacement and be cautious with your cautery uh, machines avoid using monopolar go by bipolar as much as possible and uh, and be careful with your high speed drills as well now the other thing which a rare complication but you you should be aware of is injury to the vertebral artery and which is usually with your discectomy and in plate preparation the <clears throat> the trick here is not to go beyond the uncinate process so that is the lateral extent of decompression in acdf if you come across uncinate uh, uh, process or uncle's joint just stop there don't go lateral to it now the other thing which i i would uh, like to touch upon is re surgeries in anterior cervical discectomies so if you have to operate the patient for the second time it is preferred that you go on to the contralateral side but before doing that have your ent evaluation done by the uh, by your colleagues ent colleagues you need to be sure that there is no vocal cord palsy in case you would have injured the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the index surgery then it is it is uh, preferred that the patient uh, then you approach the pa patient on the same side rather than going from the opposite side uh, pankaj it, yes sir uh, actually uh, vivek is covering most of the complications so you carry on with the main procedure okay okay so i'll just briefly take you through the through the experiences which so far we have done and uh, it's all about uh, like nearly 43 patients we have done we have done majority of were trauma but obviously we have done quite number for degen as disc and uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathies and things like that the complications which we have come across so far has been one patient of uh, three column injuries where we needed a posterior instrumentation and one obviously as i was talking about is facial injury we had a complication of facial injury in one of the patients of trauma quickly taking through the uh, cases uh, sir let me know if i am exceeding the time so so that i can hurry up. okay time is not the issue but you co concentrate mainly on the uh, technique we have to okay. tell them how to do it okay okay so this is um, I, i'll be now taking you through the examples this was a case of uh, fracture dislocation c5 c6 c7 with bilateral facet joint uh, facet jump with complete quadriplegia frankel a quadriplegia and here you can see how the facets uh it uh, bilateral jump facets were there and we managed to do it all by uh, front especially with fresh injuries you can manage to do it by front okay similarly another case where again traumatic quadriplegia fracture dislocations all managed from front we managed to publish this also uh, where We we suggested that anterior surgery itself is enough for three column injuries, provided it's it's fresh, and then you can just wait for and watch for any implant related complications in case this come up. Then you go for posterior additional procedure. This is a case of central cord syndrome, multiple PIVDs with central cord syndrome, and this would be a very good case for uh, ACDF. So we did a three le three levels uh, ACDF for this patient. and uh, patient was doing fine after surgery another case of cervical myelopathy neuric grade 2 and jo score was 12 you can see here you can see there was a there was a compression just behind the vertebra <coughs> and uh, we managed this case by this other uh, axial cut mris which you can see here we did a corpectomy here and did a acca for this patient 
this is one follow up of uh, disk where uh, we did a acdf and a good follow up doing patients doing wi fine at two years now the other indication which i commonly use uh, where where i commonly do acdf is spondyl discitis tubercular spondyl discitis this was a young female with kyphosis and lot of neck pain this was managed with the acdf and that's how the follow up series can looks like now uh, some of the examples of uh, corpectomies a burst fracture patient c7 this would be a good indication for corpectomy did a corpectomy and uh, anterior fusion now i'll take you through one few of the extended indication as i was talking uh, when you go slightly low down or higher up and uh, and how things are like this was a, a, a fracture dislocation c67 with frankly complete dislocation you can see six bodies lying in front of seven and uh, we did a control traction intraoperatively managed to reduce the lock facet and then finally did a corpectomy here you can see the cord so we did a corpectomy of c6 and did a c57 fusion this is one of the cases i've recently done again extended indication where you have to go above the hyoid bone so the moment you go above c3 things are slightly difficult approaching from front this patient had uh, tuberculosis spine c3 c4 with compressive myelopathy these are the mri images and uh, we did a anterior corpectomy of c3 c4 and did a anti instrumentation all the way from c2 to c5 so going to c2 is slightly difficult as i said anything above higher bone is difficult there are more and other important anatomical structures which are at risk so i think when you talk about acdf it's it's about knowing the anatomy very well right or left approach side approach i think i leave it to you people because neurosurgeons have a tendency of going from the right while orthopedic surgeons have tendency to go from the left i prefer to go personally from the left side and when it comes to decompression obviously anterior pro approaches has proven to have excellent decompression whether it is cervical spine or dorsal spine or lumbar spine also complications can can be catastrophic so knowing the anatomy is of paramount importance thank you